Welcome to Shrink Wrap, new insights in psychology, the world premiere, the very first show, and welcome to my guest, Jim Spira. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I looked at your website and was kind of bowled over by everything that you've done so far in the field. Uh, what I don't know is anything about where you're from. Well, grew up in the Midwest, in Wisconsin, did my undergrad at the University of Wisconsin, then uh, escaped the cold winters mm -hmm. and went out to California where I spent most of my life in school and beginning my career before finally coming out to Hawaii five years ago. So did you want to be a psychologist when you were in kindergarten? When did that happen? Pretty much. I remember when I was in fifth grade yeah. and I was listening to the teacher speaking to me, uh, speaking to the class. And I realized I was hearing her voice in my head, but I was also hearing another voice in my head, my voice, kind of repeating what she was saying, thinking about it. It was the first time I really had awareness of the noise that I have in my head and the interpretation that I was having. I went up to her after class because I was very fascinated with this idea of speaking to myself or am I, was I hearing her voice in my head or my voice repeating what she was saying? What is this thing called thinking? So I went up to her and I said, excuse me, Mrs. Anderson, do you have voices in your head? <laughs> she went, uh, what do you mean, Jimmy? I said, well, I just started noticing I have voices in my head. What are the voices saying? And I realized at that point I should just shut up. <laughs> Never say this out loud again. <laughs> And, but was and very you've been on medication since? Ever since. <laughs> uh, but I really became interested in how we perceive. And it became a, clear to me as time went on, and I kept having uh, kind of introspection, that we don't see what's here. We see what we interpret as being there, that we put together based on the sensation we're receiving, based on our history and experiences, our expectations. We, kind of meld that what we pay attention to are our thoughts about things, not the thing in itself. And that became very interesting to me, so I decided to go into cognitive psychology, neural, cognitive neurosciences, which I did, and I specialized in that as an undergrad, and then went to graduate school at UC San Diego in cognitive neurosciences, and uh, developed programs and in artificial intelligence to try and understand how we perceive and comprehend, and my specialization was attention. Because by that time, since the age of 17, I had been doing Zen meditation pretty much every day and uh, had done some seven-day retreats and a number of weekend retreats as well. And was very interested in showing how the way we attend to things and interpret things influences our suffering, our interaction, our understanding of life. Mm -hmm. So when you say attention and meditation. What's, what's the connection between attention and meditation? Well, at least at the beginning stages, I think what we try and do is uh, develop certain attentional states. As we know from EEG studies, there are four different... EEG, that's where they put the electrodes on your head? Right, and yeah. get the electroencephalo electroencephalography, the uh, readouts of brain. Now you can just see the EEG, it's a spiky pattern, yeah. right? But you can split that out mathematically through some sort of transformation to get four qualities of attention, four basic qualities that every neurologist and most psychophysiologists look at pretty commonly. Uh, there's low, like zero to four hertz, very slow wave called delta, uh -huh. which is associated with deep sleep. Okay. There's also theta, which is four to eight hertz, which is a little faster, but still pretty slow, and that has very little effort, no or very little consciousness, and it's the free floating of ideas, mm. daydreaming, hypnosis, that kind of state. Mm -hmm. uh, higher theta is where you might be driving down the street, daydreaming, talking to someone on the phone, not really knowing where you're going, but you mm. get to where you're going. Right. Or when you're a deeper theta toward delta might be where you're starting to go to sleep, but if the phone rings, you can wake up, answer it, you say, oh, I'm sorry, were you sleeping? And you say, no, I was just kind uh -huh, of, uh -huh. you know, resting. Uh -huh. It's that kind of state. Yeah. And you can make use of that in hypnosis. 
Uh, then there's alpha, 8 to 12 hertz. This has a little more uh, focused attention, a little more effort, uh -huh. but it has, it's associated with receptive attention, receptive attention to sensation. So looking at a sunset, looking at the clouds. Remember when you were kids, maybe lying on your back and staring up at the sky and looking at the clouds. That's a very receptive sensory awareness. Uh -huh. uh, getting a massage. Uh -huh. um, you know, that, that type of thing. And also meditation. If you take it to the extreme, if you really enhance the alpha, it would be sitting, eyes open, ears open, skin open, every sense open, and just receiving what you're seeing, hearing, without producing anything, without any productive thought. Mm. But we'll get back to that in a moment. Yeah, that sounds hard. And then there's beta. Beta is what we have typically thought of as thinking, where I have an idea, a thought, and I impose that on the world. I'm looking for uh, a red apple. So I'm going to scan the environment till I find a red apple. I just take in as little information as I need to to confirm, confirm what I'm looking for. So that's beta. Now you can have low beta closer to alpha, which is sports, like playing tennis. You're, mm. you're focused. Uh -huh. You're expecting that ball to come, but right. it's very sensory oriented. Very instinctual, too. It can be. I mean, yeah. instinct based on skill at first yeah. is not so instinctive. Yeah. You have to make a lot of effort. And so more beta is involved. Higher level beta, around 20 hertz or so, is more having a thought, having an idea, and imposing it. Doing math equations, uh, writing to someone that's that's uh, more abstract thinking, giving mm. a lecture. Uh -huh. Most people go through that. Is that what you're day. doing now? Now is more beta. That's uh -huh. right. It's more focused, planned, organized from the inside out. There's something called gamma, which is up in the 40s, that has just begun to be looked at in meditators. And that seems to, there's more gamma, more 40 to 44 hertz in experienced meditators. Seems to be associated with more open awareness. Wow. But little is known about that so far. We just started discovering that a few years ago. So that's only for super experienced meditators? Everybody has all these wavelengths. Uh huh. But the more experienced a meditator you are, the more gamma is shown. Oh, okay. What I find with very experienced meditators, is that their delta, we all have all four of these at all times. When you're sleeping, delta is predominant. When you're under hypnosis or daydreaming, theta is predominant. Also, if you have ADHD, theta is predominant. Ah, is that, can they actually noise. test for ADHD that way? I always do. Yeah, I throw EEGs on people's head, just a simple office unit, and you can see a lot of theta, and then you give a beta task. You give some simple math for people to do, and their, their theta should go down. The beta should really come up. But with ADHD, the theta gets bigger. It's like more noise. It's more chaotic. Is that only ADHD with the hyperactive, or is it also ADD? Mostly ADD. Ah, OK. Cause, so put me down for an appointment. <laughs> so the you know, attention deficit disorder, yeah. inattentive type, gets a lot of that theta. If you add hyperactivity to it, because there's not that much prefrontal cortex activation, mm. uh, as the prefrontal cortex gets more activated, often with beta, then the midbrain uh, settles down. But if you don't have much prefrontal cortex activation because of a lack of dopamine or what have you, then it's like a seesaw. The midbrain comes up more and uh -huh. gets more agitated. Uh -huh. So you give someone meditation exercises or focus exercises, and that can help settle down. You give them Ritalin, that also can help us settle down. So, uh, but then so alpha, wait, so well, mm -hmm. you just brought up a very interesting subject, the whole pharmaceuticals thing versus other kinds of treatment. So you're saying that sometimes instead of doing Ritalin or Adderall or whatever the latest drug on the market is, you could do meditation? Well, I think you should always do meditation, uh, no matter what. <laughs> and you can gear, and I'll explain a little bit later, the different types of meditation, how it can be altered and specifically geared towards someone's needs. Wow. And then you find out what someone is capable of altering and improving through natural methods. And then you can supplement that uh -huh. with medication if uh -huh. need be. I see. Now, certain things like paranoid schizophrenia, bipolar 1 disorder, real manic depression, 
uh, I would start with medication uh -huh. and then temper it with meditation and other cognitive ah, so approaches. So you find that meditation is also uh, effective with severe mental illness? Oh, essential, essential. Wow. So meditation can and has taken many forms and then we can talk about how to alter those for different diagnoses. Right. Uh, in the West, we think meditation more to be contemplation. Right. I'm going on a meditative retreat. It means I'm going to remove myself from the worries of day-to-day -day existence so I can think about more existential ideas or spiritual ideas. But there, it's really still beta consideration ideas. It's really in my head and thinking things, right? Putting things in perspective. Uh, yoga tradition, the Hindu tradition, used yoga as their experiential approach to become literally yoga yoked with God was the meaning the Sanskrit meaning oh. and so to be yoked with God you have to dissolve your individual sense of self to be connected with other you see that same attempt through uh, the Hasidic tradition in Judaism uh -huh. through uh, or earlier Hasidic in the Middle Ages more so in uh, still you see the practice of davening where there's rocking and chanting so an attempt to get beyond self. You see that in mystical Christianity. St. John of the Cross wrote about this in Dark mm -hmm. Night of the Soul, Sister Teresa of Avalon. Uh, many Middle Ages, there's a book called The Cloud of Unknowing, where they said in order to be accepted into God's grace, you have to enter into the cloud of unknowing where you no longer have an idea of God. In other words, where you're no longer creating God in your image, uh -huh. right? Again, this top-down, conceptually driven idea of God. So the Buddhist literature, the Buddha was uh, a Hindu practitioner. That, I'm gonna mm -hmm. ask you to, I got the voice of God in my ear telling me we need a break. Okay. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Sorry, that's a bad. Aloha, my name is Jim Sean, and I'm host of a show called Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Each week, live streaming at noon on Think Tech Hawaii, we interview people who have special insights into education from early education through K-12, all the way through higher education and beyond. Both public and private are areas we're interested in. We dig deeper, we try to find out uh, what it's really like to be involved in making change, advocating for it, how you reform, what people's philosophies are in reforming it. Uh, as I said, we're live streaming every Wednesday at noon on Think Tech Hawaii. And later on, you can find these interviews on YouTube and on the Hawaii Educational Policy Center website. We hope you join us as many times as possible. Aloha. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap Part 2, New Insights Insight. I'm here with Jim Spira. Got that right this time? Yeah. Close. Spira. Right. Why, why does that happen, Doctor? <laughs> because it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. No, but I mean, why do I have trouble remembering people's names, even when you told me five minutes well, ago? Well, we know from the study of attention that the more fully you attend to new information coming in, the easier to retain it. When you're thinking of other things, like you have to be vigilant about time, topic, other things, your attention is split. Ah. And that's what meditation, especially Buddhist meditation, does. It helps train in full-on attention. So Buddha really revised and renovated the field of meditation in about 500 BC. What he did was he practiced the typical yoga practices. All mm -hmm. were very beneficial, uh -huh. but he wasn't quite able to break through uh -huh. and break through to complete selflessness so that he could be fully present with what was going on. And what he did when he finally did break through is realize that there were four basic principles. One, that we suffer because uh, we think, because of our attachment to our thoughts as if they're real mm -hmm. we create suffering right and only when we dissolve those that well in order to dissolve suffering we have to dissolve our thoughts 
mm-hmm. even temporarily, so that we no longer take our thoughts as if they're real. Mm-hmm. The extreme would be uh, paranoid schizophrenic mm. that sees conspiracies, that sees symbols, that, right, and they really believe that these are true. Mm-hmm. Someone that's bipolar disorder really believes that you're from the KGB and mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. going to arrest me for something, for jaywalking yesterday. I've heard all these stories. You have too. Uh, they believe their thoughts as if they're real. We all do. We all believe that this is a hand, that that's a shirt. Uh, but what we don't appreciate is that we put our own color on it, our own interpretation. Right. Right. And so we become intolerant of others. Plus, it makes us feel isolated. If we have an image of ourself as an intact entity, mm-hmm. then we see others as separate from us and other things that we don't have, so we crave other things. Right. So the fourth principle is that in order to help understand the true nature of things and our true nature, we have to, he came up with an eightfold principle. Right. I just want to talk about the seventh and the eighth. Okay. The seventh principle is called right mindfulness, uh-huh. which from which mindful meditation has developed. There's a tradition in Burma and many of the southern Asian countries called Vipassana. Mm-hmm. And from Vipassana, they've developed this strategy of developing awareness. So when you have a thought or a feeling or a craving or an anger, you just notice that. You don't have to react to it. Mm-hmm. If I'm uh, craving food, I can notice that craving. I can realize that's just a craving. I don't have to act on the craving. That's a hard one, though. Like if your craving is a cigarette or methamphetamine or to beat somebody up. <laughs> or sexual desire right. or Right, so how do you get that? from the thought, the action, to the thought, just noticing the thought? You practice, you practice this meditation technique of just still sitting, focus on just your body, sitting, breathing. When you just sit and you try not to produce thoughts or you just stop producing thoughts, you just feel your body. I mean, what's left when you no longer think what's left? What's left is what you see, hear, feel in your body breathing in and out, just this natural process, your heart pumping. If you just sit with that, then you'll notice how you tend to produce thoughts and react to the thoughts and react to the reactions. At some point, you just say, just let that go. The thoughts are there, you can notice them. The feelings are there, you can notice them. Like anger coming up, I get so angry when people disrespect me or because of what that person did to me, I'm so angry at them. You just notice it. You notice your anger, you sit with your anger, or sit with that thought. It goes, just like the breath goes. Then you turn back to what's here, just the breath coming in and out. The feeling of my feet on the ground. The colors coming in. So by practicing this mindfulness technique, we learn to allow the thought and the feeling to occur. It's natural, but we don't react to it, we let it go. Okay, so let's say uh, John comes in as a client. And every once in a while, he experiences blind rage. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular kind of meditation you might do with him for that? Yeah, first I'd explain to him the sequence of things through some typical cognitive behavior therapy overview. Meditation is not therapy. It's a tool that can be used within a therapeutic context. Mm -hmm. So I'd find out what is maybe... Uh, his upbringing was, is this the role model he thinks he should have? Yeah, my father beat me all the time. Right, so we explain that. I say, okay, it's understandable why you're acting this way and reacting this way, Uh, but clearly it doesn't seem to be working for you. We'd have to get him motivated to want to stop because John doesn't come in because... Yeah, I don't want to stop because my wife said she's going to leave me. Right, that's why they come in. (laughs) So, all right, clearly it's not working. And sure, if you're teenage boy disrespects you, welcome to the club. (laughs) Your teenage boy disrespects you, and then you fly into a rage. Right. Now you're the bad guy. Right. He's not going to learn anything from it. Right. And he has every justification now, et cetera. So you have to do motivational interviewing. You have to do cognitive therapy. Explain things. Get him on board. 
But once he's on board, says, yes, I need to stop, but I don't know how. By the time I recognize it, he's on the floor all bloody and my fists are all bloody, right? Yeah. In extreme case, but, yeah. or I've yelled at somebody, or I've yelled and stormed out of the house. By right. the time I realize the anger came, it's too late. Right. All right, so, and that's, that's at least awareness and uh -huh. motivation at some point. Uh -huh. Then we say, so what's coming up? What are the steps that get you to that point? Clearly, it's not just happening. Mm. It feels like it because mm. you're not aware of what's going on. So mm. we try and break it down. And some people can get that cognitively or not. I show them how to do meditation at that point. Mm. I show them how to, and this works, the mindfulness approach works really well for people that have impulsivity issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, bulimia, mm. smoking or drug desire, uh, uncontrolled sexual compulsions, mm -hmm. anger. These mm. things work really well, uh, can be improved through a mindfulness meditation. So I'll have them just practice, maybe start 10 minutes a day. Just sit, feel your breathing flowing in, flowing out. Uh, just be aware of the cool breath coming in, the warm breath flowing out, how your body's expanding and releasing. Maybe at first they have to take five deep breaths, but then just notice the natural breathing that's occurring. But doctor, every time I do that, I get these thoughts racing through my head, like exactly. just nonstop. So let me step you through maybe a three minute okay. mindfulness meditation Great. that I would lead them through. Okay. So sitting comfortably in the chair, it doesn't have to be totally relaxed because discomfort, pain can also be helped through this. So just sitting your spine as straight as possible your eyes can be open and looking downward or closed if need be. And notice where your energy is. Are, are you attending to your thoughts? Are you attending to your breathing? Are you tending to discomfort in your body? Just notice where your attention is. And whatever is going on in your mind or body, simply allow that to occur. And then draw your attention to the air flowing into your nose and out from your nose, effortlessly. And notice every quality about that breath. You might notice it's a little cooler flowing in, a little warmer flowing out. You might notice the location that breath touches and how that location feels different from the inflow to the outflow. And as you're paying attention to every quality of the breath at your nose, if thoughts come into your mind, just notice that you're producing images or sounds in your mind. Let those go, or let your attention to that go, and redirect your attention to the air flowing in and out. If you can't completely let those thoughts go, you can allow them to be there off in the distance, but you don't need to pay attention to them. You can let them be there. Just like you might hear the sound of traffic outside, you can let the traffic sound be there. You don't need to pay attention to it. You can redirect your attention to the feeling of the breath. And then notice the way your chest expands and releases effortlessly without even trying to breathe. Just simply allow the breath to breathe you. Your chest expands, your ribs expand, your back even expands, and then you can just let it go. And every time you let go of the exhale, you can release a little bit more. At the bottom of the exhale, just let go of that breath a little more before it naturally fills you. And every time you feel yourself trying to breathe or getting to the breath, it's okay to let go of that control and allow the breath be natural and to breathe you. Like a gentle massage from the inside. And 
finally fold your hands over your lower belly and feel the warmth of your belly warming your hands. And notice how that warmth rocks forward and back effortlessly with each breath. Continue to feel the air flowing in naturally on its own, flowing in cool, filling your belly, and emptying effortlessly from your belly, warmer, softer. This is your basis. This is your core. When thoughts arise, you simply notice those. Let them be. Just notice whether they're in images and words. Notice the process of thinking. It doesn't matter what you're thinking about. Just notice that you're creating images, that you're creating sounds in your head, that you're having feelings in your body. Simply notice that. And then redirect the attention back to this breathing, how your body is being breathed. And allow that to be sufficient. By practicing this, when anger comes up, you can notice it, you can allow it to fill you, and then to not react to it to allow it to pass away, just as you allow the traffic to pass by, just as you allow the breath to pass by. Like wind through a tree. The tree is stable, accepts and feels everything. It doesn't hold on to anything. It doesn't pursue it. It experiences it as it's happening, allows it, feels it completely but doesn't react to it at all. Okay, go ahead and open up your eyes. The typical practice of that would be about 30 to 40 minutes every morning, every evening. Serious practitioners, that's what they would do. But to start, even doing that for 10 minutes a day gets a lot of benefit. But you have to practice it before you get angry, before you get a compulsion to do something. You practice this when you first wake up and maybe before you go to bed. Then when you need to put it into effect, when you have this compulsive urge, you feel it, but you don't have to react to it. You just allow it to be. A lot of people mistakenly think that by being non-reactive, you're becoming cold and aloof. The opposite is actually the case. Because when I react, I'm kind of shutting it down. I'm just trapping something and that's it. Even love. If I have desire and love, I can feel it, I can allow it, but I don't you know, I grab onto it somehow or pursue it. I just feel it fully. It's like every breath is a new breath. Every inhale is the first inhale I've ever taken. Every exhale is the last exhale I'll ever take. And the same with love, and the same with seeing my lover. This is the first time I'm seeing that person, the first time I'm feeling this, every time. So by being totally present, it's being totally fresh and honest. Instead of getting an idea of the person, wanting to get some end point with that person, just being totally in the moment. So you actually feel much more fully by doing this practice. Wow. That's one practice that's based on this seventh, uh, kind of what they say, uh, seventh principle of the Eightfold Path. The eighth. Wait. Mm -hmm. I got the voice of God coming into me again. I think we need another break. Great. Aloha. I'm Kirsten Baumgart Turner, and I host Sustainable Hawaii every Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. My guests offer insights on challenging economic and environmental issues facing our state, and offer innovative solutions to increasing Hawaii's long-term sustainability. Recently, we've been focusing on sustainable land development food, and energy security. If you have a project or issue you'd like to discuss on the show or would like to be a guest, please contact me at kirstenbturner at gmail.com. And tune in live weekly or view the show at your convenience at thinkpeckhawaii.com. Mahalo. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island in the ER position. 
Every other Tuesday, I get to host a show here on the Think Tech program about healthcare. We call it Healthcare in Hawaii. It's really enjoyable for me to bring other healthcare leaders from around the state to talk about our pressing issues. Hawaii has long been the health state, but we need to keep up the momentum, the inertia, and with your help and with your participation, we can come and share all of the big issues that are pressing day to day. Thanks for joining us every Tuesday, alternating weeks from 2 to 2.45. Welcome back. This is Steve Katz with Shrink Wrap, New Insights in Psychology on thinktech.com. And I'm here back with my guest, Jim Spira. That's correct. And you were just about to tell us about the seventh or the eighth? The eighth principle in what uh, Buddha, the original Buddha, had taught, and the main practice was sometimes called concentration, but it's better thought of as full absorption. Full absorption into the moment. So this is not too dissimilar than what we, from what we just practiced, mm. but let me lead you through this so you get an idea. Wow. The idea is that in order to understand how we produce thoughts and attach to thoughts, yes. it's good to let that dissolve. If you can let go of something, then you can see it when it arises better. Oh, okay. and understand that it's not a fixed principle. In cognitive therapy, we talk about looking at fixed uh, patterns of thinking mm -hmm. and then switching them for more reasonable, right. productive right. ways of thinking. But people have a hard time letting go or even identifying those fixed mm, ways right. of thinking. Right. One way is just let go of thought in general and that's see hard. how it comes back. You'd think so. <laughs> if I say, don't think of a pink elephant, well, that's hard because you right. really want to think of the pink elephant. Right. But if you instead absorb yourself in something else, ah. then it's relatively easy. Well, isn't that something else a thought? Let me show you why it's uh, not. Okay. Uh, if I look at something, if I look at this and go, that's a hand, gosh, uh, you know, I used to be a much more muscular hand when I was working <laughs> out, and I don't like that hand. Oh, uh -huh. my nails Those need are to thoughts. be done. Those are thoughts because I'm having a reaction to the sensation. Okay. But the sensation itself is just a sensation. What I think about that, why is he doing that? What's he mean by that? Oh, I get that. Those are thoughts. The cognitive reaction. What I produce in my mind is a thought, but what is coming into my brain is just pure sensation. So let me show you a very, very powerful, very simple, in fact, it's the simplest activity we could possibly do, mm. and also the most powerful meditation I've ever experienced. Okay. I'll just show you again a little three, four minute exercise. Okay. So again, sitting, and this time do keep your eyes open. Okay. Because we're not trying to separate ourselves from the world, but rather join with the actual world that's here. Okay. And with your spine straight, don't relax against something, don't lie mm -hmm. down. Have your spine erect, maybe sit on the edge of a chair, sit upright. With your chest, your spine forward, your chest up chin in so your spine is straight nice and clear and alert just like the yogis talk about shoulders open hands at your lower abdomen and look downward slightly but not at anything in particular just that general area with your eyes open ears open skin receptive all your senses open Focus on one area of visual information, the light, the color, the patterns. And feel as if you're simply allowing what you see to flow in, fill you completely. And you're giving yourself to what you see completely. You can use the breath to help you with this as if what you see fills you as your body expands and you give your breath away to what you see. So you're totally absorbed in what you see. If you have some thought about it, that's extra. You don't need that thought. Just let that thought go. Or if that thought is stuck in your head, let it be there, but you don't need to pay attention to it you can pay attention to this visual sensation.
And the same with what you hear. You know, what you hear is not somehow out there in the distance. You don't even need to have a picture associated with what you hear. Pick one sound. That sound is already vibrating on your eardrum. It's already being transduced into your brain. What you're hearing is already inside of you. Just let it be there. And accept it. Accept that sound into the core of your being so that that is your being. What you are is simply this sound. And give yourself to it. And you can use the breath to help you with that. As if as your body expands, you're accepting what you hear. So it fills you and that's all you are. As you exhale, you give yourself to what you hear completely. And the same with any feeling, any discomfort, any sensation in your body. Allow that sensation to be, to fill you. Feel as if the breath is centered in that, expanding and releasing. without even trying to breathe. Because what is the breath? It's just the expansion and release of the body. Simply allow your body to be nothing other than that expansion and release. That acceptance and letting go. so that you don't need to be producing any thoughts at all. It's enough to simply accept what you see, hear, and feel until that's all there is. And then give you everything away that you are to what you see, hear, and feel until that's everything there is. Everything else interferes with that and is extra and unnecessary at this moment. When you find yourself thinking, if you find yourself creating images, going off somewhere in an image, notice that, let it go, and replace it with the image right here, the image that's already on your retina, already inside of you. If you find yourself thinking in words or sounds, or conversations, music, notice that, let it go. Accept that sound that's right here, already inside of you. Give yourself to it. So that's all there is. If you're wiggling, uncomfortable, let that go. Give yourself simply to this natural expansion and release. In other words, just simply be here, accepting what is, without needing to add anything to it. So Stephen, that's a simple instruction. Practice that for 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes, and that's extremely powerful. Now in the middle of that, let's say it's 20 minutes in, typically people are pretty good at doing that for a few minutes, then they'll start spacing out, then they'll struggle with it, using all their energy to try and be fully here. And then after about you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they'll space out, and they'll realize, oh, okay, come back to this moment. After about 20 minutes, people have this sensation often that they're being breathed, that the light is coming to them. They don't have to try and look out there. They don't have to try and picture what they're hearing or figure it out. What they're seeing and hearing and feeling, it just is happening. And that's very powerful. You, the second time I remember you using the phrase, being breathed, which feels very mystical, like being breathed by whom or by what? Well, here's a nice example. Um, <clears throat> talking about the breath, place your hand on your chest. 
okay? Now, when you did that, you took a very deep breath. Right. You didn't need to. Why do you need to try and breathe? But we do. By paying attention to the breath, you altered it. Right. So if you alter the breath just by paying attention to it, what are you doing to me? To everything you see, to everything you think about. You're manipulating it with your beta mind, with your top-down, conceptually-driven mind. Now, that's appropriate to do if you're doing math problems or trying to figure something out or explain something to people. But why do you have to do it all the time? Why, when I say, notice your breath, do you change it? And it's not just you. It's right. a habit we all do. But you don't have to do. It's so nice to be able to notice the breath without having to try and breathe. Just let the breath happen naturally. So and the same with what you see. Look at that. We make this effort. Why do you have to make an effort to see? It's already there. Just allow it. It's the habit of our mind. We, ha we waste so much energy when we don't need to. We're always thinking, always worrying. So in terms of applications, this technique is extremely beneficial for anxiety disorders, PTSD, for obsessive compulsive behaviors, for uh, depression, where we have to figure things out. What's going on? I have to worry. With anxiety, people with generalized anxiety, those people that have anxiety most of the time, mm. the image I like to use is it's as if there's a saber-toothed tiger out there, and I have to worry about it to keep it away. Mm -hmm. The moment I stop worrying about it, it's going to devour me. Right. Right? Whatever that saber-toothed tiger is. And that's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, no, but really, it's yeah, there. Yeah, it's really, it's there, right? I, I'm so worried about driving. Why are you afraid of driving? Well, you know, if I turn the corner, there could be a gas tanker that turned over, ready to burst into flames. Right. And what are the chances of that? It could be okay. a terrorist. Could be a terrorist. What are the chances of that? Well, one in a billion, but it's a possibility. Right. And I say, no, it already is happening. It's an actuality. Because in your mind, that's how your body's reacting. That's how your mind is obsessed with it. It's already happening for you. You're already being attacked by that terrorist because okay. you can't let it go. I've got this voice mm -hmm. in my ear again telling me we have less than a minute. And so we're not going to have time for the third kind of meditation? No, that was pretty much it. Those two are the main uh -huh. types of meditation. There's okay. other movement types, yoga, uh, I got to sneak in one quick question. Sure. A lot of people are going to hear the, the origins of this as a religious thing. Mm -hmm. what, what do you say to people who say, well, you know, I'm Christian, I can't do this, or I'm an atheist, or this is all woo-woo. What do you say? That this is not a religious uh, practice in and of itself. It can be done by all religions. When I was at a Zen monastery for four years, we had Trappist priests, we had Baptist ministers, we had all sorts of people coming to learn these techniques. It's more like, I see it like martial arts training. Training the brain to be more, uh, more signal and less noise, more purely present in everything we do. I like that expression, more signal, less noise, f focusing. Yeah, I have a hard time with that, so. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, thank you everybody for watching the world premiere of Shrink Wrap. New insights in psychology, and thank you to my guest, Jim Spira. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you very it. much.